I bring, bring greetings from Trinity Community Church. And um, my wife and I are, are just so glad to be here with you. I am privileged to have yet another opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Hope everyone's having a tremendous holiday season, getting your gifts, shopping, dealing with all the stuff, family coming in, plans and preparations. Today we continue the series, Luminous, Luminous. Um, you know, as I looked at that word today, I was thinking about how, how God provides for us in such a way that even sometimes when you don't expect it, he shows up, right? And it's not always when you expect him to show up, but if you trust him, if you trust him, and if you can stand on the word of God, because there are promises that God has bestowed upon each and every one of us. And, and, and guess what? God holds true to his promise. He does, if you can wait on him. Can you wait on him this morning, church? Amen. So today we're going to continue that series, and we're going to talk about the love of God. We're going to talk about God's love. Uh, I know we all, you know, have love for God, but today we're going to talk about God's love for you, right? Because it's different. It's different than your love for him. Um, we're going to start in 1 John. We're going to read from verse 10 to verse 19. And, and be, bear with me. Is it okay if I take my time? Because I believe God has a specific and, and unique word that for the, the New City Church. And then I believe God wants to say something specifically and uniquely to each and every one of you. Amen, because our God is just that big. He's just that awesome. Amen? 1 John 4, 10. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The litmus test for you receiving God's love is your love for one another. Amen? Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. 
Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears, listen at this, has not been made perfect in love. And our operative verse is verse 19. We love him, or in the Greek, it simply says we love. Because he first loved us. Let us pray. Father, I do thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. God, I thank you that revelation knowledge will flow freely. I pray, O oh God, for the spirit of wisdom to manifest. Father, I thank you for your intelligent Holy Spirit to illumine and manifest in our presence that your word, Lord God, would go forth with simplicity and, and clarity and, and specificity. Father, I come against every work of opposition, Lord. And Father, I do thank you in advance for the seed being sown in the hearts of your sons and daughters, that it would bring forth the fruit of righteousness, some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. And Lord, at the end, we, we promise to give you all the glory that your people would be edified and you, Father, would be glorified. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. And if the church agrees with that prayer, amen, amen. So in, in 1 John... We have John, the Apostle John, trying to uh, correct some of the thinking of some of the folk that was in the church because they seem to have an understanding that that matter was evil and that Jesus did not come in the flesh. And, and as a result of that, they had this understanding that, you know, they couldn't love people, you know, that was, you know, Believing in the Son of God made flesh. John, John testified that they, they touched him, they seen him, they, they handled him, they experienced him. And he was trying to admonish these, these um, folk that, listen, you are erring in the truth because this is truly the Son of God. And one other thing that, that I kind of, you know, as I was studying this, you know, God, God kind of takes me through certain, certain things, and I'm thinking about uh, how things are in the world today, right? And, you know, it would make one wonder, you know, where, where is God? Where is God in this? And, and guess what? God, God is in the earth. He's in the earth through me. And he's in the earth through you, right? God has done everything that he's going to do. He has acted and he has spoken. And then he has given us authority in the earth. And so, like, one of the things that we all need to be mindful of, when you think about God's love and God's love for us, what does it look like? How can, can I, as a believer, know that I am operating in the love of God? 1 John 2, 15 and 16 gives us some insight. It reads, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, for a lot of years, I, I used to literally read this as the love for the Father, and it's nothing wrong with having love for the Father, but perfect love, perfect love is God's love towards us. Amen? The love of the Father is not in him for all, listen at this, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. How are you operating in your love walk in the world? Would we be able to differentiate you amongst those that are in the world? Are you proclaiming to be in Christ, but acting as if you're in the world? Because there is a difference. We are called to be light in the darkness. Amen? So the cross has made a difference in, in how we view God and how we approach God. Because before the cross, it was about man's effort, man doing to please God, man doing, you know, the ten, the big ten, right? Trying to achieve to appease, right? After the cross, God fixed all that. He said, you know what? I think it's time for me to fix this whole problem and send the solution, send the antidote to every malady, right? And so God did something that was so unique, if you would receive it, it would transform your life forever. Amen? And so God sends his son into the earth. But here's the thing. He, he sent Christ, he sent Jesus into the world to first of all reveal the Father. Jesus didn't come in the flesh first and initially to talk about himself. He came to demonstrate and to reveal the heart of the Father. Amen? And, and, and what is the heart of the Father? What, what does that, what does it even mean? I looked up that word Father, and it is the Greek word pater or pater. It means one who imparts life and is committed to it. Imparts life and is committed to it. He imparts life from physical birth to the gift of eternal life through the new birth or regeneration or what we like to call it as being born again or born from above in the Greek. Amen? It is through he imparts and he provides through ongoing sanctification for the believer to more and more resemble the heavenly father. What it does not do it does not speak of a universal fatherhood, right? So this is about personal relationship, right? To obtain, receive, and, and, and to walk in this love, you have to receive it for yourself. Amen? So again, the law was about man doing and then Christ comes on the scene to demonstrate God's work in redemption and for humanity. In Matthew 22, 37 and 40, we see Jesus uh, confronting some of the Sadducees. And he says, the love or love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, we got to talk about this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Does anybody do that perfectly? Like every day, every hour, every minute. 
But that's what the task was in the Old Covenant. To love God with every part of your being without fail. And we can see through the Old Covenant, they failed. David failed. Moses failed. All of the Old Testament prophets, judges, and kings did love God when the anointing of God was upon them to perform a specific act or exploit. And then some like David, you know, who I thought was a Old Covenant uh Old Covenant prophet with a New Covenant mindset, right? That David tapped into something that, that most didn't because David ha- had insight and revelation from the Lord, just, just like some of the others, like Isaiah. Isaiah had wisdom beyond his years. You know, another one, Old Covenant prophet, New Covenant mindset, right? Today, we have New Covenant believers still, still, still walking in an Old Covenant mindset. For, for, you know, we need to try to flip that around. And then we also have, which is another error in the church, right? We have some that are mixing covenants, right? Let me have a little bit. Now, now that I'm saved and born again, you know, that now maybe I, I can do the law. That now maybe I can perform a little better. You know what the Word of God says that you cannot put new wine and old wine skin. So we need to be very intentional about the covenant that we are in today. We we are in this new covenant, but when you think about Jesus coming to demonstrate God's love, right? He had some disciples. And I want to utilize two of them to kind of illustrate how we as believers kind of demonstrate God's love on a day-to-day basis. And I want to use Peter and I want to use the Apostle John. Peter was one of those apostles that, oh, I got to love God. I love you. I'll go to the end of the earth with you. I'll die with you, Lord. Let me go. Very little understanding did Peter have, but his heart, his heart was right. And I'll share to you, with you why Peter's attitude, you know, didn't measure up when it counted. John, however, like me, I practice the love of God for me. He called himself the apostle that Jesus loved. And you don't see that anywhere else except in John's gospel. He was the only apostle or disciple of Jesus Christ that was constantly declaring he was the apostle or the one who Jesus loved. He understood Jesus' love for him was greater than his love for Jesus, but it was because of Jesus' love for him that he was able to do the things that he was called to do. And it's interesting Because at the cross, who do we see? We see John. See, when you understand God's love for you, you become available to Jesus to do what he needs you to do. However, when you think about Peter, when you're constantly boasting about your love for God, right? What happened to him? Right. He had to be restored. He had to be restored because he denied Christ three times. Right. When you boast about your love for God, it's it's a form of pride. Because when you think about declaring love, love is not just words. Love is an action. It's an action, and it's an unconditional action that you display to someone or another. But 
But when you think about God's love towards us, you think about something that's constant, that's firm, that's consistent. But when you think about our love, it fluctuates. You know, we, we are, you know, up some days, down others, you know what I mean? Depending on how much you are in your word, how much you rely upon the spirit of God, the word of God, the love of God, would determine your love walk. It would. One of the things that, that I love is John 3.16. I mean, this has been a foundational scripture for me, and, and I'll show you why. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he so loved the world. Look at that. Look at the intensity of that. He so loved the world. That, that speaks to God's intensity to do something about the condition of humanity and then help us to live out life, you know, in a, in a better way. For God so loved the world that he gave. There's the action. He gave. And, and what he gave wasn't just, you know, something he picked up off the shelf. It wasn't something secondhand. What he gave was his only begotten son. Heaven's absolute best. That whoever believes in him, do you believe in him today? Should not perish. That word perish means to be lost, ruined, or destroyed. Amen? But have everlasting life. Let me park there for a minute. Everlasting life. We all have it. We all have it, but what does that really mean? That word everlasting is the Greek words, ionaos zoe, right? And it means unstoppable life. It means life that cannot be extinguished. It means a life that when anything comes up against it, it barrels it down, right? And that life is to stop the perishing. However, here's the thing. Can I explain? <laughs> In order to manifest eternal life, the Bible says that uh, faith speaks what it believes, right? Eternal life, or Ioneos Zoe, on the inside of us really does nothing for us unless it manifests, right? And so because we are created in the image of God, guess what? We are to act the same way God acted. And the way God acted was he spoke the thing. He declared things. He called those things that are not as though they are. Right? Faith, let me tell you something about faith. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, it talks about having the same spirit of faith. That word spirit, if you look at it uh, in all the definitions, one of those definitions for spirit is vital principle and mental disposition. What does that mean, Dan? Well, vital principle is, means that something's alive. Like you take your vital signs when you go to the doctor to see what's working right and what's not. The vital principle of faith is that faith speaks what it believes, Roman 10, 6, right? Faith speaks what it believes. The mental disposition of faith is that faith is, always is. Not, not going to be, not, not in the sweet by and by. You have what God says you have today. If you would open your mouth and say that, if you would open your mouth and, and demand sickness and disease, to, to be gone, or if you would demand finances to increase, 
right? Of course, there needs to be some agreement in your walk in the word, but, but when we speak God's word, God's power is in his word. God says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Doesn't mean God has to say it. It means whoever speaks his word, you are speaking the power of God to change a thing. Amen? And so we need to be as God created us to be. Like there is a dimension that I call the fourth dimension. That is a dimension that we live in along with the third dimension. The third dimension is the physical material world, right? However, God lives in the fourth dimension, which is the spirit realm, right? We simultaneously exist in these two dimensions. However, the promises of God exist in the fourth. We speak what's in the fourth to bring into the third. And we have access and authority to do that. Why is it then that some of us do not experience the promises of God the way the Word says that we should? That's just a process question. Let me share something with you, right? I had an experience some, some years ago. When I found that I was speaking about the love of God, I was like, yes. Because I didn't think God loved me. I couldn't get it right. Addiction was beating me up. I, I couldn't sustain myself in a way where I would experience continual success. And I knew, I just knew in my heart that there was more. But I just couldn't seem to manifest it. And it would eat me up. I would be in churches that would tell me, well, Dan, you need to pray more. Dan, you need to read uh, your Bible more. And God knows I did all that to exhaustium, all that, to the point that my performance, listen at me now, my performance led me to homelessness. And it was, I'll never forget this, it was sitting on the side of a bed, I was reading a book about the love of God, this very scripture that I read to you, 1 John 4, 2, and 15, 15, and 16. And when, when I read that verse that, that says that the love of the Father, for some reason, that thing just illuminated in front of me, and it was like a pound of bricks just fell from my forehead. And after that day, after that day, God began to reveal to me more and more about his love. He began to reveal to me about his grace. And there were some things in my life in that moment that just dropped off. And I promised God, I said, if this is the power that you have, then guess what? I'm sticking with you. I'm sticking with this right here. And, and, and it has caused some controversy in my life because some people don't, you know, think I'm a little dogmatic. Some people think it, it don't take all that, Brother Dan. Well, you're absolutely right. It don't. It's God. Right? But what I do is, I magnify the grace and the love of God that, that he has demonstrated in my life. And I know the love of God. I know the power of God because I know what he has done for me. That programs, treatments, and all that other stuff did not fix for me. I can't speak for nobody else. I'm talking about Daniel Perry Lumpkin today, what the love of God did for me. And, and it has caused me to 
to, to, to have and continually develop an intimacy with God that I value so much. I cannot live without him. I cannot live with live without him. You know, I love my wife, you know, and she'll and she'll tell you. Sometimes she'll she'll be in the walk walking around the house like, are, are you done yet? <laughs> I might be studying or doing something or preparing, and she gets it. You know what I mean? But that's just like I'm just compelled to the Word of God because of His love. And I, I, I used to like really, and, and I really mean this sin, sincerely, right? Um, if you will allow God to reveal Himself to you, and if you would trust him, hold God at his word. Because there are days I have to say to my daddy, listen, dad, this is what the promise is. I'm bringing you in remembrance of your word. That settles it. So be it. Thank you very much. And I just thank him for it. Right? Because faith believes is. I believe in the moment that I pray that I have what I say. Amen. I'm off my notes, y'all. Hold on. So when we think about Jesus coming, revealing the heart of the Father, and, and, and him going to the cross, I want to share a quick story with you about Abraham. In the story of Abraham in Genesis 22, we have Abraham being tested by God. He's being tested. You know, he, he had had the promised son, and, and he was... Uh, tested by God to, to take Isaac and, and take him to Mount Moriah, strap him up on an altar, and sacrifice him. And sacrifice him, right? It was a three-day journey. They're going up the hill. Isaac's looking at his dad saying, you know what, Dad? I see the wood. Where, where, where is the sacrifice? Abraham, walking in faith, says God will provide. God will provide. And so we pick up the story there in Genesis 22 and 12. And he said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Because of Abraham's faith, Listen at this. Because of Abraham's faith and his obedience to God, God blessed him, multiplied him, gave him victory over his enemies, and told him that he would have a great nation, right? And, and we get in on that blessing through Christ. Amen? Or not or, but what, what have you sacrificed? For Christ. What have you sacrificed for Christ? Your time? Facebook? Your finances? Something to think about, right? You will never understand God's love for you until you fully and completely understand God's love for his son. Because it is the same love that God has for his son Jesus that he has for you and me. And when you understand that, I mean really understand that, on, on, on a deep level, there's no need to perform. 
that there's no need to posture. All, all, all you need to do is, is, is walk. Walk in the truth that you know, and God will reveal more and give you the grace to overcome in those areas where you struggle. Rather than beating yourself up when you miss it, you know, repent, thank God for His mercy and His forgiveness, and ask Him for the grace to do what you need to do. It's just that simple. We don't need to wallow in the muck. You know, you, 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 you don't need to, like, you, you know, uh, do three Mar Hail Marys and, and whatever. No, God's love for you is so strong and so personal that he wants you not to run from him, but run to him. When you miss it, when you miss it, that's when God's love is so much more for you because that's what the love came to do. Amen? The love of God provides the sacrifice for sin. And we see, we, we see that in Galatians 2, 20 and 21. Paul declares, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, or in this physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, the faith of the Son of God, the faith of the Son of God, who loved me so much. Me. Not Paul. Me. And that's how you need to see it, too. That God loved you so, if you were the only one on the planet, God sent Jesus for you. And that's how you need to see it. It's personal. I mean, I love y'all. I do. For real. But, but when it comes to the things of God, you, you, you better be a little selfish, right? Because once you, once you get it and once you, you, you know it and, and you've experienced it, man, giving it away becomes nothing. It, it becomes pleasure to, to display God's love. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, so stop trying to do righteousness. Like, here's another one. I don't, you know, I don't want to step on nobody's toes, but obedience. You know, I hear a lot of people talking about got to be obedient, and you do, I'm not dismissing obedience, but obedience is a fruit. Obedience comes from you receiving the love, and by receiving the love, there's something that's working on the inside of you that is manifesting obedience for you and it becomes fruit. Don't get me wrong. We are to intentionally seek and desire to walk upright before the Lord and others. But when you get into performance orientation, this is how you know when it's you and it's not, you know, through the spirit and love of God. Because when you fail, you get upset. Because you missed it. Because you couldn't do it. Right? When it's through the power of the Spirit, there's no pressure on you. You can just walk it out. If you miss it, all right, Lord, you know, we need to get this right. You know, may, may, 
Maybe I'm trying too hard. You're exactly right. Stop trying and start resting. Resting in the love, right? So we see that being crucified with Christ has has now taken us out of the picture, right? You have now been crucified. You've been buried. You've been crucified. Now think about this. Think about this. Let's, Let's process through this. If you were crucified with Christ, and you were, and Christ was buried, and so were you, right? Romans chapter 6 tells us that we were united with Christ in baptism, right? Tells us that. So we were buried with Christ, but we was also risen with Christ. But, but, but think about this. When we were buried with Christ, the body of sin was buried with him. The body that was raised wasn't the same body. Same Jesus, different body. The body that was raised was the glorified body, the glorified sinless body without blood. That's where we are in him. So, stop trying to fix the old buried dead man and start renewing the new creation in Christ, right? Because that's where sometimes we get stuck. I mean, I, I'm not minimizing, and hear, and hear what I'm saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when you renew your mind, when you renew your mind in the Word of God and you really, truly, completely understand that you were buried when Christ was buried and you were risen when He was risen, then you would understand that you are a new species of being. You are not that same person that you used to be, right? So so, so stop, stop turning back there. Stop, stop owning what was back there except that you were buried, that you were crucified, and you were risen with Christ, for as he is, so are you in this world. Amen? You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Not a poor sinner saved by grace. No. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's powerful. I tell you, that right there is the love of God in manifestation. And and there is nothing on the planet that could do that. Absolutely nothing. No self-help book. Right? No, no, no philosophy. Right? Nothing. Nothing. And so I want to move into looking at a story in the Bible, the prodigal son. Many of our many of us are familiar with that, with that story. But but I would like to to point out, because I know we, we've kind of been taught that the story is about the son. And it is, but what I see is the love of God on display, right? And so we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to pull out some nuggets, and and we'll be done. Amen? Luke 15, verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. Certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my stuff. I want my stuff, Dad, and I want it now so I can go do me. Daniel's translation, right? 
He said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now, I know this, like, let me try to give you some, some, some understanding of, of what's happening here. This is Jesus, again. This is Jesus telling the story. Jesus is giving us what I believe is a, a, a picture of God's love, right? This is the thing, right? Um, he hadn't went to the cross yet, right? So he's kind of giving a preview of what the Father's love is like for us, I believe, and, and for them. But think about what this, this son says, because there's a spiritual application and there's also a practical application. Because I also believe that, that this son could also be the born-again experience. Because I believe some folk can walk away from God while they're in Christ. You get born again, you know, you're, you're you know, feeling the newness of this new life and you're grateful for it and you say, thank you very much, God, I think I got it from here. And we go on, you know, and I hope that's none of us in here. However, let's move on. So he divided to them his livelihood. He said, here you go. You can have it. And then not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in the land. Didn't take him long, did it? And he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Like, we get born again, and sometimes, you know, we go join ourselves to some things that we ain't got no business joining ourselves with, right? This, this isn't just, and hear what I'm saying, because it has two applications, right? This is part of what uh, we've experienced based on Adam. That's one, and I think this is also what can be experienced while in Christ. Amen? So then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in, into his fields to feed swine. This is a Jewish boy now. Think about that. And he would gladly have filled his stomachs with the pods that the swine ate. Come on now. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He couldn't even get a handout. It was either uh, the pods or it was nothing. So the, 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 the father, like when you think about Jewish tradition, the father's obligated to... to give two-thirds of the inheritance to the older son and then the one-third to the younger son. That application could also, the, the, referring to the two sons, uh, it, it could also refer to the, the Jewish or the, the uh, Israel nation and the Gentile nation, all right? But however, the, the feeding of the swine, like I said, he was... Jewish, like this guy was totally, he had totally forgot who he was, or it didn't matter anymore, right? And I'll explain a little bit of that later, but verse 17 says this, but when he came to himself, thank God he came to himself, right? So, so hopefully it doesn't take losing everything and, and then having to eat the slop that that swine eat to come to yourself. 
all right? But that was his story, amen? That was his story. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? So listen, his motivation was just because he was hungry. That was his only motivation for wanting to go back home. But let me finish. He says, how many of my hired servants, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish, here we go again, I perish with hunger, meaning to be lost, ruined, or destroyed because he had separated himself from Ioneos Zoe, eternal life. So, I just think this is interesting. Let me read this again. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants? Remember, hired servants were were like, they weren't family. This guy's family. And he's willing to accept being less than family. How many of my, hired, my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, listen, he's rehearsing what he's going to say to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So, Clearly, we see being separated from the Father, he forgets who he is, right? And being separated from the Father, he perishes, right? He, he's lost his rank in the family, right? He, he said it himself, I'll be a hired servant, right? Even the bondsmen and the, the, the servants of the house were, were considered not inner family, but like right outside the family. They, they were treated better than the hired servants. The hired servants was the ones that day-to-day got hired that, that just needed work for the day. They weren't even connected to the family. So you know he had lost his mind. Willing to be excommunicated from the family to be viewed as a hired servant. Let's continue. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. Now, let's just take a look at at what the father does here. Amazing. He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. His father saw him had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's what the Bible says. And I don't hear any confession yet. I I, I don't hear nothing coming out of his mouth before the Father exhibits this extravagant love. And what do we do? Uh, you, gotta, you need to confess your sins before God. And I'm not saying we don't do that. But I'm telling you and showing you what the Bible is saying. That God is looking for him. That, that, that not, not only was he looking for, for, for him, he had compassion on him. He's moving toward him. And then jumped on his neck and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, pay attention, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, didn't even respond to him. Do you see the love of our God? 
Like his love is so amazing that that he now don't again. I believe what the son is doing is admirable. I believe that that should be the posture, but what I'm telling you is God doesn't seem to be looking for it. It doesn't seem to be a requirement. Do you understand that? Even though the son did return back to the father, it's not what the son did or didn't do that's on display. It's the father's love that's on display. The Father's love will restore relationship, hear this now, unconditionally. Unconditionally. You don't have to worry or concern yourself, God's out to get me. No, He's not. He's out to love you. He's out to hug your neck. He he has compassion on you. He he wants to bless you. Come on home. Come on home. So here's here's the crux of it. While with the father, while with the father, the son experiences the favor, the fellowship, the influence, and all that the father had until he chose to go out on his own, the Bible says that the son was dead. That word dead means separated. He was separated from the influence, favor, fellowship, goodness of the father. But it's the father that restores him to the favor, fellowship, goodness, and all that the Father had unconditionally. Unconditionally. Ephesians 2.1 says, says this, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So it's through God's love that we are restored. We are restored. Who were dead or separated in trespasses and sin, separated from what? The favor, the goodness, and all that God had for us. Amen? But there's more than that. He also put a robe on him. He put a robe on him. He put a ring on him. He put sandals on him. Robe, righteousness, right? He did not disgrace the son. He honored the son, and he put a robe on him, which demonstrates right standing with the father. Amen? The ring is for mastery or possessions. That is the family signet ring. That means you are now possessor of everything that the father has. Amen? The sandals was about status because the family were the only ones that wore shoes. Everybody else had to walk bare feet. So that said something about who you were in the family. And he talked about, let me be a hired servant, right? God sees you better than you see yourself, right? God will always go exceeding abundantly above what you ask or think. Amen? And then he talked about uh, killing the fatted calf. That's the sacrifice, right? All of these things stand for, you know, how God provides for everything. Like the son, what did he bring to the table? Nothing. God did everything. The Father has blessed this son, who, 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 take it out now, he took the inheritance, lost the inheritance, 
and regains more. Restoration. In one of the offerings of the Old Covenant, which Jesus fulfills, the trespass offering, in that law, it says that if somebody steals something or something is, is, is broken or something needs to be replaced, they have to restore that, and then they have to restore one-fifth more. Jesus is our trespass offering, and he is an over and above offering for our sin. So what that means for us is it doesn't matter where you are, what you have done, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? So stop letting the enemy beat you up with his onslaughts, accusations, and all of that, because we have an advocate. Yes, we have an advocate. And sometimes it's okay to just tell the devil, you know what, you are absolutely right. I did it, but guess what? Jesus fixed it. Now do something about that. Because listen, when you, when you try to act as if it was something you did, you ask him for the devil to torment you. When you throw Jesus out there in front of him, listen, he's done. He has no recourse for that. So learn to, to, to hide yourself in the secret place. Dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, for it is there you find refuge from the storm. Amen? So in Romans 8, we have the Apostle Paul, and I'm closing. 8.31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us freely all things? Freely. Listen, if, if God has given us heaven's absolute best and, and realizing that God is love, he doesn't have love, he is love. He, he can't be anything else. And given us Jesus, who is heaven's best, how will he not also with his love and Jesus heal you? Healing is a small thing. The, the power that saves is the power that heals, and the power that heals is the power that saves. So when you got born again, you got healed too. Some of us don't realize that. Jesus covered it all. All. Paul goes on to say, for I am persuaded. Are you persuaded today? I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So remember, boast in the Father's love. Boast in the Father's love for you, right? Let that love be on display. Amen? And then in closing, my last scripture, thank you for being patient with me today. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, this is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. 
But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates, here it is, unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. So let your boast be in the Lord. And I guarantee you, if you allow God to be God in your life, He will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Amen? Thank you for having me.